my patent was uh, enforceable for 17 years. Uh, it ran from 87 to 2004, and then it became public domain. And after it became public domain, it still is selling. We, we estimate it sold 20 million copies worldwide. Welcome to The Well. I am Brandon Edgens. And I'm Anson Mount. Today, we'll be focusing on a particular moment in the career of Ward Fleming. If you haven't heard about his pen screen or how he came up with the idea, we suggest you go back and listen to that episode now. Now, there's another part of the creative process we don't discuss very much on The Well. That rough intersection where art meets commerce. That's a very rough intersection. And this story of this particular intersection occurs in much simpler times way back in the 80s in New York City, where at the time, Ward had a studio in Tribeca. I was collaborating with an artist in New York, Reggie Young, a, a furniture designer. And we put our heads together and I designed a tabletop with, that must have had 350,000 pins in it. He, he designed the proportions it would be and the base of it, a beautiful set of legs that went with it. And then we put a big piece of plate glass on it. And the diners could sit there and eat in comfort, but they could also reach their hands underneath it and stroke the underside of the pins. You could sweep your hand all the d way down the six foot length and still see your hand wavering at the beginning. And so <clears throat> that we showed at FIT and Andy Warhol saw it there and wanted it. And he was a big barterer and he conserved his money by bartering and, and used, his, uh, used his factory and his notoriety. He really had a printing press for money in that he, they were all on canvas, but they were, they were all silk screens on canvas. Yeah. And we traded him this pin screen for these four silk screen canvases. And uh, I was able to flip that, flip those paintings and buy the property up here in the Catskills where I live now. So far, so good. Ward sold some Warhols and purchased 114 acres of Woodland property. Later, for reasons we're about to get into, he had to sell some of that property, which I purchased and built a cabin upon. So, so you 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 basically buddies with Andy Warhol? Yeah, I'm basically buddies with Andy Warhol. <laughs> after that, I love the way history works this way. Like who? Like I didn't even know this until after we'd bought it and you know started building there, and I realized, looked around the woods, I'm like, oh, thanks, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the uh, for the acreage. <laughs> But the story of this is all art world stuff. You know, artist makes a cool thing and mm -hmm. sells it for a million bucks. That's not exactly what happened. Because we are about to enter into the cross streets of art and commerce. And it's going to get crazy. I, I took it to a trade show in New York. And I showed it there and, and I got... A lot of recognition. I got the award for best of show, and uh, and and that's when people said, "Okay, this is this is going to be it." You know, like the frisbee or like the etch a sketch. Or, so I could tell that was what was happening. So I had a really thriving business in New York, making these myself with a whole process that we came up with to, to mass produce them. And I was the only game anywhere for two years. And we did really well because you couldn't get them anywhere else. And then when he came on the scene, I had three years before I was out of business. My suppliers started calling me and saying, who's this other person who's knocking our door, trying to get exactly what they want, what you have. I knew who it was, and I had found out that he'd gone through my trash and found uh, references to my suppliers 
or enough of them that, that he started making it himself. But importantly, he had the means to do it in overseas, in Korea. They were making it for $2.40 over there, U.S., and I was making it for $24 here, U.S. Well, who is he? Steve Zuloff. Who the hell is that? We, we're going to find out who he is. Well, I mean, he's a trash jumper, for first of all. At least. Or I should say alleged trash jumper. <laughs> Just to protect our own asses here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what kind of a person... <laughs> does that yeah that's insane and like and ward you know and i, I maybe it's because i am friends with ward i could couldn't help but feel sort of protective i'm like who does this to ward <laughs> he's like <laughs> the nicest guy like what did he ever do to you want to come up with your own damn ideas <laughs> but that's not steve you know but again it's I, I, I didn't know this part of ward's story until we sat down and did this interview and i just could not believe and it gets it gets a lot. He, this guy gets a lot more brazen. It gets a lot weirder than just going through trash. He had a lot of chutzpah. He 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 would pretend to be me at these shows. Holy! <laughs> so, so I, you know, I didn't witness it myself, but a friend of mine was at the show, and he was claiming to be me. Did that ever cause confusion? I mean, like, did it, did, did you ever get a call from anyone saying something like, "Oh, I just saw you at the." Thing and you're like, no. <laughs> well, there were. I didn't witness it, but a friend of mine saw it and became incensed mm-hmm. and started. And Steve had a lot of people around him mm-hmm. as he was show because he was a great showman. Mm-hmm. He could show this piece, and you could see his face, and he was really selling the shit out of the pin screen. He projected well, and mm-hmm. he was he was like a great performer, mm-hmm. and so. And I didn't have those chops. You know, I was... So my friend saw him and, and, and heard him refer to himself as me. And he lost it. You, you know, and he started screaming at the guy. George was out of control sometimes. And he started screaming at him and drove all the customers away. <laughs> and Steve was left there kind of hanging like a limp flower. Like... <laughs> It was bad for business, you know. But it's not very often outside of like a Victorian murder mystery does someone get to stand up in a room and yell, Imposter! <laughs> I mean, he was a much better salesman than I was. And he really was the one who I think is responsible for it becoming the hit that it did. Was that his background? Yes, he... He was a toy maker or something? Was yeah, it? he was... He, he had ripped off that um, conservation of motion exhibit, oh, yeah. which... Or toy, which is six balls suspended with triangulated strings. Yep. And you, you, you let one swing, and it, it transfers energy through the whole mass to the other one, and it's black, black, black. The word I got was that he, that was his first foray into, into taking other people's ideas and making, you know, making a good show of it. His first foray into intellectual theft, <laughs> property theft, and, and it worked out well for him, so he, just, he, kept, he kept going down that road. Yeah, yeah. And again, none of, he had no original ideas, but he was a hell of a marketer. It seems, like, it seems like this happens a lot. There's like a repeating thing throughout human history. Yeah, like yeah. The idea I, guy and then the sales guy. <laughs> you would hope they'd be on the same team. Yeah. But, uh, and I think, yeah, it's it would be very unlikely that they would be on the same team. I mean, I mean Steve knew what he was doing mm-hmm. uh, as far as that goes. But was it patented before he started? It was It was patent pending. Oh, okay. Oh, is that, was that what made it difficult? Uh or made the thing drag out for so long? Or? Uh, part, yes, partially. But I went into the patent office. I made a trip to the patent office specifically to sit down with an examiner. And I walked into the room, and she had seen the night before, by just by happenstance, the the Nova show where my pin screen was 
shown at the Exploratorium being used by all these people. And I walk in the door, I brought a pin screen with me and I showed her on the table. So the combination of me going there, her seeing that, and having seen the show, I had my patent in two weeks. So that was showing up really did make a difference, or it seemed to, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who decides to themselves, I'm going to be a toy inventor impersonator? Like, wh- who does that? I, you know, I think, you know, I, I've heard of other stories, not just toys, but I, I, think there's, I feel like there's kind of a, I don't know what else to call them, sort of a, in the animal kingdom, they would be vultures or leeches or something, but like music has it, film has it. I mean, every industry has this class of people that are just kind of waiting for some unguarded idea to cross their path and they just snatch it and they're just you know just waiting for something to fall through the cracks and then they run off with it and then you can't pry it out of their hands <laughs> and there are people who do this with domain names now too there's somebody exactly. owns ansonmount.com and I could really give a shit they hold domain names for ransom so if I went and tried to buy it they're going to Yes. Ask for thousands of dollars. Exactly. It's it's yeah. It's the same kind of. Me- oh, now it's different. It's it's not really. They're not claiming to be ants and mount. They're not claiming mm-hmm. to have been, you know, mm-hmm. been in crossroads when clearly I was in crossroads. But I think the mentality is the same. It, it's clearly that it should be yours. It's clear. I mean, no. Why would anyone? You know what I mean? There's no other reason to do it than to take something that should be yours, and legally kind of um, make a claim to it yeah. for the purpose of ex- of extortion. Really? Yeah. Anyway, these things can be, can create huge messes. And, but eventually Ward got his patent finalized, but he had to lawyer up to deal with this guy, Steve, who is still making knockoffs of Ward's pin screen. I hired a a litigating patent attorney in New York who was a very smooth operator and he he had defended the knockoff of Enro Rubric, who came up with the Rubric's Cube, mm-hmm. and was successful, I guess, in defending. So he was on the opposite side of the equation there. That, did that go pretty smoothly? I mean... No, it didn't, but, oh. but it, it it went on for a long time, and it was very expensive. Oh. And uh, When was that? That was in... Uh, in 84, 85, 86. You know, we did uh, make amends and, and started working together. Oh, and then it, then it really worked well. I mean, the alternative would be me on my own, lonesome, mm-hmm. ha- with no connections. Competing with to a do, factory in Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it just was not going to happen. Well, but through my lawyer, because he convinced me that there was no other marketer like Steve Zuloff. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, that seemed to be true. He really sold it well. Mm-hmm. I don't think it would be the success it is unless he had, you know, it, it, was, it was a symbiotic relationship, an unlooked for and an unpleasant one for me. But it worked out for the best of all of us. Then you just had counterfeiters. After that, right? There were people just outside that were just like kept proliferating. Well, they were, they were, yeah, I had, so he was the big one, but then there were four more. Eventually we licensed all of them, but my lawyer was, he got me, he got my rights back and got all the producers to, and distributors to recognize the patent and pay a royalty. Oh, good. Yeah. So it did have... It wasn't the really sad ending where you get nothing. You know, <laughs> it was it was a little more upbeat than that. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> what is the moral of the story? Crime pays. <laughs> I think the moral of the story is. You you need to if you're going to be an artist and have this not happen to you, you need to also be a businessman. There's a few artists out there. There are very few artists that do that. You know, like and there's some of my favorites, David Bowie, um, 
and Stanley Kubrick are jumped to mind as two artists who were like also fantastic business people and they controlled everything for that reason. But, you know, and Ward recognized that, as he put it, didn't have those chops mm-hmm. to, to sell at that scale, you know, and I am still I mean, of course, it was really unpleasant when he was going through it, but I'm, I'm still kind of knocked out by sort of how chill and philosophical Ward is about all of this. So many years later, I mean, after the fact, he looks back and was like, "Okay, it sold tens of millions. What what would it have sold if it had been just me?" Yeah, man, you got to be able to put your emotions aside <laughs> to to get there, man. That that's that's yeah. Well, Ward's a little bit of a Zen master, so he's he might be the only one who could <laughs> who could cruise through this. I don't want to undersell it. I think it was really, really I think it was very stressful for hey, him. It I just was super say, unpleasant. I just got to say if if I caught somebody pretending to be you, uh-huh. I would definitely embarrass them in public and I'd be like there is no way you're Brandon Edgens because you cannot possibly drink that much. <laughs> You know what? And, and just for that, if I see someone impersonating you, I'm going to pretend that it is you and and give credence to that person and say, this is definitely Anson Mount. And he works for ISIS. <laughs> and he works for ISIS. I know him. I would know him anywhere. <laughs> that is not an imposter. <laughs> Hey there, WellPod listeners. We are excited to announce our newsletter, where we'll be sharing bonus content like behind-the-scenes photos, links to interesting sites and articles about our subjects, and updates on guests. And you'll be automatically entered to win special giveaways that we'll be announcing very soon. Just go to our website, thewellpod.com, that's thewellpod.com, and hit the Newsletter and Subscriptions button. Signing up is easy and fast, and we promise to keep your info private, and you'll only be hearing from us every few weeks at the most. Thanks. And now, the credits. The Well is produced and edited by Anson Mount and myself, Brandon Edgens. Bonus theme music performed by Brandon Edgens, based on a composition by Jonathan Meinberg. Additional music by Crown is provided under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial share-alike license. Music by Poddington Bear is provided under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial license. Special thanks to Ward for sharing his harrowing account of old-school identity theft. And remember, when you hear someone claiming to be Anson Mount, it's probably not. It's probably an imposter, or more likely, me. Please check out our website and sign up for the newsletter. Have a great week.